network problem. I don't understand why. So I may not be able to get to that like demonstration part of it. But it might take us the whole lecture to just develop the problem, understand the problem, and develop it. This lecture is going to be kind of uh, integrating the whole thing that we've seen in this course. And so you should see how all the various parts fit together in solving a control problem. Uh, going all the way to stability, the last part of it and talk about uh, stability. But as I said, D and E, I'm not sure whether we would get in today because they have a problem with network. I don't know why. <coughs> Okay, uh, let's not waste time on that. Let's just start. Uh, are there any questions before I start? Now, this is a variation on the same problem that we have been talking about in the last time of the lecture. Okay, so what do we have here? We have three tanks in series. Okay, tank one with a certain volume, the numbers are all given for us, and tank two with a different volume, and tank three with a different volume. Now, this is a heated tank problem, but try to look at the figure and see whether you can figure out what is happening there. And what does your <laughs> what is the process? Describe the process. What is happening? If I ask you the question, for example, identify the measuring element, the process, the controller, the final control element, I guess <laughs> some of them are labeled already, <laughs> but uh, what can you say about the process? How does it differ from what we have seen before? Three tanks in series, and the measurement is being taken from the third tank. Okay, but the controller is applying the heat to the first tank. So your task is to control the temperature T3 from the last tank, and you are not doing that by adding heat directly to T3, but you are doing that by adding heat to uh, tank one. Okay, and that should raise the level of tank two, and eventually should raise an element time three. Now, do you think this would be an easier control problem or a difficult control problem? For example, if I just have one tank, I add up all the three volumes, V1, V2, and V3, and I have one tank, okay? Will that give me a better control of this one or this one? Why do you think this would be more problematic? So what kind of response would you get if I make a set point change in uh, TR by one degree? What kind of response would I get? You know, for a first order process, what kind of response you would get, right? There's the one atomic one. But if I put a feedback loop, then it's no longer first order, right? So you can have some sort of an overshoot. Now, if I have to ask you to guess, what would be the order of such just the process, three tanks in series, what would be the order of that process? What would be the relationship between T3 and Ti, the endless temperature? Did you say third order? Right. But so each one is a first order. Without the feedback, it's going to be a third order. Um, with one minute, did you have a question? That, that is a good question. If I have a larger tank, to heat up the larger tank is going to take a lot more heat. Okay? So the response of the larger tank is going to be taking longer. But if I take the combined volume, V1, V2, and V3, okay, and 
have a single tank with sum of v1, v2, and v3, and then compare it with this kind of a setup, and I have the three different tanks, then the time, con the effective time constant for the first order process is going to be the same. It's not going to be any larger. Okay, but what would happen here is think of the following logic. Okay, if you, that is not clear to you, think of it this way. Um, I, I'm making a step change in the temperature by five degrees. Okay, so um, in order to achieve that step change, there is currently a steady state operation. Okay, so a process is operating at a steady state, meaning I have I think I have that wrong. Right on the apologies. Uh, okay, so when I make a step change from a steady state operation, uh, the controller will then immediately sense an error. Okay? Under steady state condition, there is no error. Okay? And uh, when I make a step change, there is an error, so the controller immediately turns on the heater. Okay, so that heats up tank one, but it, its effect is not felt in tank three until that liquid goes to tank two, heats up tank two, and then goes to tank three. Okay, so by the time you sense any increase in temperature, tank one has already become very hot. So that is the cause of the delay. Okay, so as the temperature is rising here, the controller say, okay, I'm reaching the required set point so I can shut off the heat. But by that time, what has happened in tank one? It has overshot too much. It is not a pure transport delay. Okay? If it is a pure transport delay, the effect would essentially be the same. Why do we say that? Because you know that the pure transport delay can be approximated through parity approximations as a first order or a second order or a third order. Can be approximated. Okay. So it depends on the magnitude of the pure transport delay. The pure transport delay is very large, then it's going to be equivalent to a very high order system. But if it is small, then you can approximate it either by first order or a second order system. Okay. But the effect, the net physical effect is going to be the same. The mathematical representation is slightly different, but the net physical effect is going to be the same causes a delay in um, transferring in, in what the delay between what you measure and your control action. And that causes a lot of stability problems. So this is a very interesting problem from that point of view. We can play with many things to learn about the dynamic response to see how to get the thing under control by tuning with uh, the control parameters. Now, the problem description is that the flow rate is 500, 250 pounds per minute. It's water, density of water is 62.5, and the three volumes are given, 4 foot cube, 5 foot cube, and 6 foot cube, and the heat capacity is 1 pound per BTU, uh, 1 BTU per pound per A few other things are given. A change, this you should be able to interpret so that you can understand what are the controller gains and what are the heater gains and things like that. Okay? So a change of 1 PSI from the controller changes the flow of heat by 500 pounds per minute. Okay. So the controller sends out a pneumatic signal in terms of a pressure change. So if the pressure changes by 1 psi, that means the heater has to increase the input of heat by 500 BTU per minute. That gives you the gain relationship between the controller and the final control element. You need to figure out, right? we are going to construct the block diagram that we can use in simulate from this. So the temperature of the inlet stream may vary, so Ti may vary, and there is no lag in the measurement element. Okay? So uh, in the measurement part, it's, uh, there's, no, there's no transfer function for that. Draw a block diagram for the control system and develop the appropriate transfer functions for each block. That's a fairly long process. Okay? And uh, we're going to do that from fundamental, from first principle. And the second question is develop the overall transfer function relating the outlet temperature T3 to the set point change. Okay. And find the offset, find the offset for the unit step change in inlet temperature. The controller gain is 3 psi per degree Fahrenheit of temperature error. And the derivative time constant is 0.5 minutes. So there's no integral action, 
there is only a proportional action. The proportional constant is given, 3 psi per degree Fahrenheit, and the derivative constant is given, tau d, is 0.5 minutes. The fourth part is set up the simulating simulation and play with different control parameters. And the fifth part is uh, uh, determine the expected transfer function in MATLAB uh, using symbolic toolbox without using the simulink and determine the stability of the closed loop system. Determine the stability of the closed loop system. Okay. If you have any questions on all the five parts, you have an idea of what needs to be done. This could be a typical final exam question because it integrates everything in the course and the solution we will develop in the same manner. Uh, you are going to end up with a much higher order system. Okay, so I won't ask you to factor anything more than a quadratic and do partial fractions with anything more than a quadratic. But other parts you should be able to do. So here we're going to end up with uh, eventually a fourth order system if you have an integral action. Okay, the question is clear. So let's try to sketch what the block diagram might look like. And we will get into some difficulty in figuring out the units in, uh, between the input and the output. And then we will develop uh, block by block what the transfer function looks like. Okay? So let me draw this. OK. So I have tank 1, tank 2, tank 3. And this is T3, this is T2, this is T1, and this is Ti, the inlet temperature. And I also have a flow rate W. Okay, the flow rate is constant, so there is no level change. Okay. And what I have is a sensor here that sends a signal. Okay, so these are all going to be units of degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, W has the units of uh, pounds per minute, okay, and this has the units of degree Fahrenheit. And so this is the measurement element, the thermocouple. In this problem, I'm going to take it as directly giving degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, if you have a thermocouple, the signal might actually be a voltage. Okay, but here I have degrees Fahrenheit that is going into the controller. And in the controller, I have the ability to do the set point. I can adjust the set point in the controller. Okay. So that is also going to have the units of degree Fahrenheit. So there is a measurement and a set point. So the difference is going to be an error. And the controller, based on the error, implementing the control action, proportional and derivative control action, sends a signal to the final control element that is in PSI. Okay. And the final control element then sends out, what signal does it send out? It will send out a Q. This is where we will have a difficulty. So some, somehow it, the heater is the final control element, and it sends out a Q. Okay? So but the signal that is coming back, when you put the block diagram, does it have to be in Q, or does it have to be in degree Fahrenheit? You need to figure that out. Okay? So let's just put that as a question mark. Okay, what are the units of that particular stream? Okay. Um, and we have given all the information that we need. Let me just summarize that. W is 250 pound per minute. Rho is 62.5 pound per foot cube. V1 is 4 foot cube. V2 is 5. And V3 is 6 uh, foot cube. AC is given as 3 PSI per degree Fahrenheit. And tau D is given as 0.5 minutes. Okay. And the control action is only um, proportional and derivative. So we're going to write this as 1 plus tau D. Is everybody comfortable with this one? Why did I write the uh, proportional derivative as 1 plus tau ds? Okay, you should now go, go back to the notes and see how we relate the output signal from the controller to the error signal. Okay? So when I have a derivative, 
I'm saying that it is proportional to the derivative of the error. And when you do the trans Laplace transform of the derivative, it is always s times that function. Okay? That's how I get for derivative it is s, for integral it is 1 over s. Okay? So that transfer function is already known in a sense, given to us, the, the controller, the PID controller, with no integral action. Question? No, PID controller is the most commonly used controller in industry. Well, I think the problem doesn't give us the integral action, and we will see the consequence of that, and we will see when we put the integral action, what happens to it. Because one of the questions that it asks is, what is the offset in part B or part C, I think. Okay. So there is going to be an offset if there is no integral action. Even though there is, so far we have not studied derivative action. So the first time we are introducing the derivative action, and even though we may have a derivative action, it doesn't get rid of the offset. The offset will still be there. So we will then put a the variation on this problem. We'll put integral action, see uh, whether we can get rid of it. But you are asked to find out what the offset is. OK, that's one other question. Find the offset for a unit step change. Maybe only the pure uh, proportional and derivative action. OK, so we have summarized basically everything that is given to us. Now let's start building the, the, we have some question on the final control element because the units really don't seem to match there because what comes out is PSI and I'm sending a signal back and uh, what I'm effectively doing to tank uh, one is going to be a temperature signal that comes out. But that will become clear once I write the block for the first uh, process unit. If I'm going fast, please stop me, okay? Or if I'm going slow, tell me I can speed up. Okay, so uh, tank one. We're going to develop the transfer function for tank one, okay? So it is rate of accumulation of energy equals rate in minus rate out for energy, okay? So this is going to be DDT of the accumulation of energy in the first tank. That's going to be the volume of the tank multiplied by density, which gives you the mass, multiplied by Cp, which gives you the uh, energy per, multiplied by T. So it's MCPP, if you like. It's the total energy content in the tank. If you take its derivative, it gives you the rate of change of energy in the tank, rate of change of accumulation, rate of accumulation of energy in the tank. Now, energy is coming into the tank through the mass stream, so that's going to be W times Cp times Ti minus some reference temperature. That is the energy coming into the stream at a temperature of Ti minus energy uh, plus there is an energy that is coming in through the heater, Q, okay? Minus the energy that leaves, which is going to be MCP times, or that be? Okay, so I should put T1 here for the tank one. It's going to be T1 minus T reference. That is the energy leaving the first tank. So this is an energy balance around the tank one. Okay, energy coming in, energy leaving, and energy coming in through the heater. And the difference is what accumulates in the tank. Okay, now, the T reference, of course, will cancel out some arbitrary reference temperature. And so we can write and uh, device rho by rho BCP. We can write this as dt1 dt equals WCP divided by rho B1CP multiplied by T1 minus uh, Ti minus T1 plus Q. If I make a mistake, I'll uh, catch me, okay? When I'm doing a writing, I make some, and make some mistakes here and there. So this is Ti, the inlet temperature, and that is T1. I already have a mistake. What is that? I mean rho v1 cp. I'm dividing everything by rho v1 uh, cp. And so that's what I have. Okay, so this is going to be my first function. So I'm going to have three such equations. Okay, this is a dynamical equation. Is it a linear equation or a nonlinear equation? What is the state? What is the control variable? 
it's a linear equation because the unknown is T1 and T1 appears in a simple fashion by itself. Okay? So it's a linear equation. Now, what are the controls? Variables in this one. What can you independently change that influences the output T1? You can certainly change Q and you can certainly change Ti. So when you're trying to represent this in a block diagram, you're going to have two input streams. One is Ti, which is a load, typically, the disturbance. And Q is the one that will adjust the feature depending either on the load or on the set point change. Okay? So for this particular block, there are going to be two inputs and one output. T1 will be the output, Ti and Q would be the input. And they are added together. And that's what gives you the summation uh, element in the block diagram. Okay, any questions? Okay, so the CP you can cancel out. And we can write this as uh, D T1 over DT. Plus, I'm taking this T1 to the left hand side. And write this as W over rho V1 T1 equals W over rho V1 Ti plus Q divided by rho V1 Ti. I'm keeping all the controllable quantities on the right hand side. Those are the inputs to the particular transfer function. And the one that I'm solving for is uh, T1. Okay. Because it's a linear one, you have two choices at this stage. You can say, I can find the steady state, introduce the deviation variable, subtract, and uh, subtract the steady state, and introduce the deviation variable before you take the Laplace transform. You can always do the linearization. Suppose this were a nonlinear problem. Assuming it to be a nonlinear problem, we can always do the linearization. So I'm going to take you through that step so that it reinforces one more time how the, how the linearization will be done. Okay? So even though it's a linear problem, you don't really have to do the linearization because it's already linear. But the same process will take you through the final result. Okay? So let's do the linearization. Linearization around the steady state. And that naturally introduces the deviation variable. Okay? So I'm going to now work with this form. I'm going to write this as d dt of t1 minus t1f. Whenever I put a subscript, it's a steady state. Okay? But t1f is a constant, so its derivative is 0. On the right hand side, I'm going to have f1 evaluated at steady state plus df1 dt1 at steady state minus t1 minus t1f. That is a departure from the steady state, okay? And then I will have, what else will I have? DF1 with respect to D, Ti at the steady state, multiplied by my Ti minus Tif, okay? Plus DF1 with respect to D, Q at the steady state, multiplied by Q minus Qf. Of course, there are higher order terms in the Taylor series expansion that we are going to ignore. Okay? So here, because F1S is evaluated at the steady state, what would F1S should be? Should be equal to zero. At steady state dt, this term will be zero. That means F1 will be equal to zero. Okay? So this one is zero because it is steady state. And we need to find out what the derivatives are. What would those derivatives be in this particular case? In the nonlinear case, you need to actually take the derivative, right? And it will depend on the variable itself. But here, when you take the derivative, for example, of uh, that function with respect to t1, what are you going to get? Here is t1. So the derivative of t1 with respect to t1 will be 1 by itself, and you'll get minus w over rho v1, which is a constant. Okay? For linear problems, it will just be a constant. But if it is a nonlinear problem, you'll have to take the derivative and substitute the steady state value there. Okay? So it's going to be uh, equal to minus, uh, what is that? W over rho v1. Multiplied by this one, I'm going to write it as t1 prime. Okay? So right left hand side, I'm going to write it as dt t1 prime. Prime indicates that deviation variable. Okay? So this is the deviation variable from the steady state. Okay. 
Okay, and that is prime. Okay, plus. Now I need to take the derivative of f1 with respect to q. Okay, that would be what? Need to go back and see where q1 appears. Now, what would that be? Derivative of this with respect to q. One over rho v1 cp. Okay, so one over rho v1 cp times q prime. Okay, q prime is a deviation variable. Plus df1 vpi in the same way, so that's going to be um, plus w over rho v1 pi prime. Okay, so that is a linearized equation around the steady state in terms of the deviation variables. The time constants are embedded in here. Okay, the next step would be what? Take this. Laplace transform. Go from the time domain to the Laplace domain. And of course, move this to the left hand side. So it's going to be uh, take Laplace transform. So S times T1 prime S plus W over rho V1 T1 prime S equals 1 over rho V1 CP Q prime S plus W over rho V1 TI prime S. Everything is in Laplace domain. The derivative now became S times T1 prime. Okay, so this is not an algebraic equation, and that can relate the input Q or the input Ti to the output T1. Okay, and that's your transfer function for the block. Okay, so it's kind of a review of everything that we have seen in assembling the whole problem. Okay, so it's going to be written as T1 prime multiplied by S plus W over rho v1 equals q prime divided by rho v1 cp plus ti prime uh, multiplied by w over rho v1. Okay. Now our task is to write this in the block diagram. Do you have a question? Um, okay. Write this in terms of a block diagram. So. Let's do one at a time, okay? Suppose Q prime is zero. There is no variation in that. That is, I'm, I'm turning off the heater. This is an open loop process at this stage. And if I have a change in Ti, the inlet temperature, how does that affect the outlet temperature? So what I want is I want to get T1 prime divided by Ti prime. What is that transfer function? What would that be? W divided by rho v1 divided by S plus W divided by rho v1. Or you can write this as 1 divided by rho v1 over W S plus 1, which is same as 1 over tau 1 S plus 1. Okay? I can figure out what tau 1 is numerically. Tau 1 is going to be rho is 62.5. V1 is 4 divided by 250. What does that be? One. Okay. So the time constant for the first span is one minute. Okay. And that is the transfer function for relating the output temperature to the input temperature. Any questions on that? Okay. The next part is let Ti be zero. Going fast or writing fast? You don't have to write it down. Okay, so let oops, let Ti prime be equal to zero. Then try to find T1 prime divided by Q prime. Okay, what would that be? Again, you're just looking at this equation and you're setting Ti is equal to zero and relating T1 prime to Q prime. So the, the, there is no change in the inlet temperature, but if I add heat to the heater, how does it affect the outlet temperature? So that's going to be 1 over rho V1 CP divided by S plus W over rho V1. Okay, so I can once again write this as uh, W over. I need to multiply, divide by rho 
rho v1 over w, 1 over rho v1 ct, divided by uh, tau 1 at plus 1, okay, so 1 over wct, divided by tau 1 at plus 1. Now, this is where you need to worry about the units that we talked about that created us some trouble previously. In the previous uh, form of the transfer function, T1 over Ti prime, what should be the units of the transfer function? Dimensionless, because it's the ratio of temperature. Okay, but in this case, it's the ratio of temperature and Q. Okay, so the transfer function on the right hand side must have the units. What should be its units? Well, we can figure it out. 1 over WCT is going to be in terms of numerical value, it's 1 over 250 times 1, should be 0 0.004 degree. But in terms of units, it's going to be 1 divided by pound per minute, it's flow rate, which is BTU per pound degree Fahrenheit. So this is going to be 1 over uh, BTU per minute degree Fahrenheit, or minute degree Fahrenheit divided by BTU. Okay. That should have the same units on the right hand side, on the left hand side. Left hand side is T prime over Q. Prime has the units of degrees and Q has the units of BTU per minute. So that should be the same units on the right hand side. Minute degree Fahrenheit per Q. Okay. Now we can put these two together. What happens if I have simultaneously both Q and Ti? Okay. So that's going to be T1 prime is going to be equal to 1 over WCP divided by tau 1 S plus 1 multiplied by Q prime plus 1 over tau S plus 1 times Ti prime. What allows us to do that? Superposition. Okay, because it's a linear problem now, when I have excitation either from the inlet temperature or from Q prime, we can add them together. Okay, so that is a trans effective transfer function for the first block, for the first process. Any questions on that? Now I'll try to represent this in block diagram. We have also done this in the past, so it's a kind of a review. So how would this block diagram look like? I can write this in one of two ways. Okay, the, the way that I have written. And if I have to represent that as block diagram, um, I will have um, a block that takes Ti as input and multiply it by 1 over tau s plus 1. Okay? So that is this part. Okay? A signal comes from there that has to be added. This is where the summation comes. Add it to another process, even though which represents only one thing, there are two summation terms in that. So the output is going to be T1 prime. Okay? But this uh, takes 1 over WCP divided by tau S plus 1. And this takes Q prime. Okay, so that will be the block representation for the particular equation that you see. Okay, do you understand that? What's happening there? Just an, uh, uh, what what is there algebraically? We are trying to represent that symbolically in a block diagram. So basically, Q prime multiplied by this factor plus one over tau s plus one multiplied by T i, which should give you T one prime. That's one way of representing. What would be the other way? I can factor out the common 1 over tau 1 s plus 1. Okay. I can also write this T1 prime as 1 over tau 1 s plus 1 multiplied by, I'm just looking at algebraically. So if I factor this out, what am I going to have? I'm going to have 1 over WCP Q prime plus Ti. Okay. 1 over WCP. If I write it like this, how would I represent that as a block diagram? Okay. 
you would, you, you would sum these two terms algebraically and then pass it to the tensor function. So you'll have Ti, there'll be a summation here, and here you will have a gain block, which will be 1 over WCP. So it takes Q prime, Q prime multiplied by 1 over WCP. What comes out from that product is added to Ti prime, and then that is passed to 1 over tau on S plus 1, and what you get is T1 prime. Now we can figure out the units for every stream that en enters and leaves. So obviously this should be in terms of degree Fahrenheit. What should this be? Degree Fahrenheit, because we're adding. So this should be degree Fahrenheit. That should be degree Fahrenheit. But here, this is coming in BTU per minute. So 1 over WCP has the right units to convert that into degree Fahrenheit. Okay, when you take this and multiply that, you will get the degree Fahrenheit. So you now know what the units of each one of these streams are. And this is going to be one sub-block in the entire picture that we are going to put together. Any questions on that? Okay. So remember this two of these versions, and we'll come back and assemble it. So now we're going to look at tank 2, tank 3, and then put them all together. Two is going to be the same thing, so rate of accumulation, DDT of rho V2 CP T2 equals WCP time. In tank two, there is no heater, okay? And these are the variations I can give in the final exam. You can take the heater, put it in the second tank, or the first tank, and put the measurement element in a different one, okay? So in tank two, as it is here, there is no heating element, and all it is is there is a stream that is coming in, there is a stream that is leaving. And the steady state, the flow rate and temperature must be the same. But when we make a perturbation, this temperature T2 will be changing with time because the inlet to that is changing with time. Okay. So that's going to be what? Can you write down? for me? How will this look like? Complete that. Input minus the output. Okay, Q1 minus T2. Now you need to, uh, this is equal to your F2. Do the linearization. I think I can now skip this part, right? You can do the linearization and you will get eventually a central function for the second one. Uh, let me give you the linearized version. Okay, so you will get uh, linearized. DDT of T2 prime equals <coughs> uh, W over rho DT times uh, T1 prime minus T2 prime. If you take these three processes, tank 1, tank 2, tank 3, would you classify them as an interacting system or a non interacting system? non-interacting system, because what happens on tank 1 affects only in the forward, forward way to tank 2 to tank 3. There is no, if you take only the process, how about the feedback control system? Is it an interacting system or a non-interacting system? It is always an interacting system, because what happens is the output, you are grabbing that and adjusting the input to that. Okay. So that is always an interacting system. It's opposed to recycle systems will all be like that, an interacting system. So now take the Laplace transform, and what you would get is this one is going to be simple: T two prime divided by T one prime. It is the output from the first tank T one. This is output from the second tank T two. They are related by the same kind of transfer function tau two s plus one. But what would tau two be in this case? It's going to be rho v two over S, I mean W, okay, and that's going to be 1.25 because the volume is now instead of 4, it's 5, okay, 1.25 minutes. So the first tank time constant is 1 minute, second one is 1.25 minutes, third one is 1.5 minutes, so the tanks are larger. 
And so the block diagram for this one is going to be something like this. T1 prime, this is T2 prime, 1 over tau to x plus 1. We already figured out how it looks like before that, okay? From Q and Ti to T1. All we need to do is connect at that point, okay? And tank 3. That's going to be the same thing. So I'm just going to give you the result. T3 prime divided by T2 prime equals 1 over tau 3s plus 1. Now, in an exam, you are also allowed to take the same liberty, okay? If you have shown me first time how it is done, second one, if you can just write it down to save time, that's fine, okay? As long as you don't make any mistake, I'll give you full credit for that. So that's going to be tau 3 is going to be rho V3 divided by W, which will come out to be 1.5 minutes. Okay? So the block diagram for that is going to be looking very similar. We know what happens before T2 prime. Okay, so we'll figure that out. Okay, what about the controller? The block diagram for the controller. This is just GC, which in this case is equal to KC times 1 plus tau ds. KC is given, tau d is given, and what comes in and what goes out. And then we can connect all these up. Okay, so what comes in has the units of degree Fahrenheit because it's that error signal, the difference in temperature that the controller gets, and the controller sends out a pneumatic signal in this case. Okay. It is PSI. The final control element. Where is this information given to you? You have to go back and read the problem. 500 BTU per minute of heat for every PSI change. Okay, that's the gain for the heater. Okay, and the gain is a simple gain. It could be there is a delay in the process, or it is a first order process. Okay, one could, uh, if depending on the heater configuration, you could have a more complicated process in the heater transfer function. But in this case, it's just a simple gain. Okay. So if it is a simple gain, then you can write this as GFC final control element, which is going to be 500. The input is in PSI. The output is in BTU per minute. That is Q. And we know how to connect the Q. How do you connect the Q? Because we're seeing the Q as an input in here. So this is where you would connect that output stream that is coming from the final control element. We'll go uh, into this one. You understand? Are we going fast? Or so there's a lot of disinterested. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I guess you have an exam coming in. Sorry, it's fine. <laughs> Okay. okay, so that's the, you have put together all the elements together, and now we need to connect them all up in a proper way. Okay, once we do that, we can, um, okay, this is time. We can do the simulate, and I will do that in the next class. Okay. So we have the process transfer function, GP1, okay, and uh, the transfer function for that is 1 over S plus 1. This is T1, this is T2, this is T3. And from there, I have the measurement element. There is no measurement delay. There's no, uh, this one is 1 over GP1, GP2, GP3. These are the three process transfer functions. Okay. There is no measurement one. and. Um, so this goes back. This is a feedback element. And this is the 
the units for all these going to be degrees Fahrenheit. And here I have the set point TR, which also is in degrees Fahrenheit. This is plus minus. It's a negative feedback. And what comes out is the error. And that also has the units of degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. And that goes to the controller, GC. Okay. And GC, the controller gain is CSI per degree Fahrenheit. That is, the controller puts out a pressure signal depending on the error signal. Okay. So what comes out of that is PSI. Okay. And that we figured out here. Okay. What comes out is PSI and what goes in is the error in degree Fahrenheit. Okay. And then there is a final control element which takes PSI and puts BTU per minute. So this is where you need to, you can get con confused potentially. Okay. So here is the final control element with a transfer function of 500 and it, the input is PSI. If I need some space here, the output is uh, BTU per minute. Pardon me? I have to hook up a Q and T add to that. Okay. To so the GP1, right. So what goes into the GP1 is always a degree Fahrenheit. Okay. So there is a TI that is coming in. Okay. Two inputs. That, 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 those are the two inputs I'm trying to tell you how to connect that. Okay. Okay, 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 okay. Let me go back. This is what I have called labeled as GP1. Because I'm putting only 1 over tau and S in the block. So what comes into that is degree Fahrenheit. So I've chosen to use this form of the block diagram representation form for this one. Okay. So the GP1 is a common uh, transfer function 1 over tau and S, S plus 1. And here I have Q and I have TI. So Ti is going to come from outside as a disturbance, and I'm going to add to that this block. Okay, this block has to go between. This is where I said I needed some space. I need to put a block here that goes between the final control element and the process. Okay, and that will have the transfer function of one over W C. That takes Q and converts it into degree Fahrenheit. So what comes out is BTU per minute, and when I put it through the heat as gain, which is 1 over WC, what comes out is degree Fahrenheit. So here I need to have a summation block. I'm sorry about this. I need to make some room here. <laughs> okay, so this is GP1, which is 1 over tau 1 S plus 1. Here I have Ti plus plus. Okay. So that completes the entire block diagram with appropriate units between uh, the various blocks, between the input and the output. Okay. So this one is the heater gain. Okay. And uh, that, that's the signaling block that you need to set up. And once you understand those, you can then from this construct an effective transfer function between T3 and Ti or between T3 and Tr. Okay, question there. As the input. Error is degrees Fahrenheit, right? Because the error is basically the difference between these two signals. Both are in degree Fahrenheit. Okay. So 
When I write it on the board, it's pretty messy. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> if I look at this later on, I will not understand what I did. So we probably need to. Uh, right. Yeah. So if you need to sample, for example, this is a question that we asked last time. If I need to, this is something that we are going to do in the next class. We need to be able to plot how T1 changes, how T2 changes, how T3 changes. In from simulate and by MATLAB or my hand. Okay. You need to understand how, how that is done. And if you want to sample Q, where would you sample Q? This is the stream that has a unit of BTU per minute. That's where you need to sample. To get how much of heat is going into the first tank as a function of time. Study this block diagram, and we're going to continue this on Wednesday. Monday we'll have the quiz, okay, and Wednesday we'll continue this. So we will do the MATLAB and simulation implementation, and by hand, okay. Hold back.